I thank you so much. Thank you to um, so for making this possible. I especially want to thank my um, my wonderful colleague Ed Edmundo Litton and Clarissa uh, Delgado from uh, Teach for the Philippines because it's part of why I'm here. Uh, Father John, thank you for for having me here and for hosting this this lecture. Um, one of the things that I really, I had a chance to be in, in um, Professor Campos' uh, lecture, and he's very funny. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, I lean more on the serious side, uh, but I love to laugh anyway. So I will go through my serious stuff, and then hopefully we'll be able to laugh together, because if we... If we laugh, we won't cry, this is the way I think about it. I'm so honored and very, very happy to be here and to have spent a week in the Philippines, which is far, far too short a time, um, to really um, grasp the, the, the profound nature of this country and, and the history of, of its people and just the wonders that are here. But I, I, I'm, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. All right, so let me get going, and I'm just going to get going, and then I'll see you on the other side, okay? <laughs> so a few years uh, before his death, Paulo Freire wrote, I think it could be said, when I'm no longer in this world, Paulo Freire was a man who lived. He could not understand life and human existence without love and without the search for knowledge. His view on the significance of love to both our pedagogical and personal lives remains steadfast and resounding across the landscape of his writings. Fede believed deeply from the personal to the pedagogical to the political in the emancipatory and transformative power of love. Freire's radical articulation of love spoke to both the personal and political arrows, grounded in an unwavering faith in the oppressed to generate the political will necessary to transform our lives and the world. In Freire's eyes, to attempt daily engagement with the social forces that dehumanize and undermine our existence without the power of love on our side is to be like lost travelers in a vast desert without water to complete our journey. It is not surprising then that Freire often came back to the notion of an armed love, the fighting love of those convinced of the right and the duty to fight, to denounce, and to announce. His is a concept of love not only meant to comfort or relieve the suffering of the oppressed, but also to awaken within us the historical thirst for justice and the political wherewithal to reinvent our world. And I speak from the standpoint of the oppressed as a colonized woman of the United States and as someone who lived in poverty until I was almost 30 years old. And so what it, had, it took for me to stand here before you and, and decide that I would commit my work to that particular political project, the, the project of decolonizing our lives and to working towards social justice and economic democracy in the world. Freire's love permeated then his existence as a man, as an educator. He could be gentle and tender and inspiring, while at the same time he could be critical and challenging, strategically unveiling individual or collective follies. Freire's pedagogy of love challenged the false generosity of those whose ideologies and practices work to sustain a system of education that transgresses at its very core every emancipatory principle of social justice and democratic life. It was this lucid recognition of love as an untapped political force of consciousness that most drew me to his work and continues to fuel my commitment to the emancipatory political project that he championed throughout his life. In my academic preparation, never had another educational theorist so fearlessly given the question of love such primacy to his philosophy, to his pedagogy, and to his politics. Moreover, he did this with wholeheartedly, without any concern for the consequences of mean-spirited critiques in the academy that cast him as unscientific, unsystematic, or irrelevant. 
For an impoverished student whose life was mired by the lovelessness of oppression, Fadi's commitment to the creation of a world in which it will be easier to love spoke to the suffering in my heart and the weariness of my spirit and the yearning of my soul. Therefore, it is no surprise that I would want to share with you today Fadi's pedagogy of love as a political force, a concept that deeply inspired my political and intellectual formation as a critical scholar, and thus my praxis in the classroom and in the world. Understanding then love as a political force is essential to understanding Freddy's revolutionary vision of consciousness and transformation. The inseparability with which he theorized the political significance of love in the evolution of consciousness and meaning. He would insist, I have a right to love and to express my love to the world and to use it as a motivational foundation for our struggle. In keeping with Fromm, uh, Fromm's contribution to this question, expressed so formidably in his book, The Art of Loving, Freire did not see love as a mere sentimental exchange between people, but rather love constitutes an intentional and communal exchange between people, but rather, pardon me, a communal act of consciousness that emerges and matures through our social and material practice as we live and we learn and labor together as educators and as activists. Across Freire's writings is found this critical view of love, often glossed over from the very people who most need to comprehend deeply his humanizing intent. Sometimes more directly and other times more subtly, Freire reminded us that a politics of love must serve as the underlying force of the political project that requires us to contend daily with the structural and relational forms of oppression as we simultaneously seek new radical possibilities for social and economic justice. Freire wrote of the politics of love by engaging with the personal and the communal exchanges he considered important to the relationship between teachers and students. In particular, he sought to encourage the importance of cultivating greater intimacy between self, others, in the process of our teaching and our learning. In this way, living with democracy and deepening it so it has concrete meaning in the lives of, of their everyday lives be, became a significant political concern in the classroom. This sense of intimacy for us to think of the democratic life as something that we are participating in, something that we are a part of and that we do with one another. We cannot be in a democratic relationship alone. Democratic relationships are built upon communal relationships, communi our, our relationships with one another, right? So here democracy and the solidarity that's necessary for the evolution, um, for its evolution are made possible through a pedagogy that's fortified by a universal regard for the dignity and equality of all people, no matter their cultural differences or economic circumstances. As such, Unity does not require uniformity or assimilation, but rather a shared political vision for a more just world. For the truth of the matter is that we all have differences. Whatever, you know, we have differences across communities, we have gender differences, we have differences related to, to our own histories, and that understanding that difference doesn't have to divide us is a very central point of his pedagogy. Freire's view of love then as a dialectical force which simultaneously unites and, and respects difference must be then imagined as this radical sense of our lived kinship, that we are in fact kin to one another as human beings in this world. If we are to effectively then challenge the material inequalities and disaffiliation that are the hallmark of capitalism, Freire speaks to a love generated from political grace and born of a collective consciousness that emerges from our shared suffering, our creativity, our imagination, giving meaning to both our political resistance and our praxis for liberation.
Through a commitment to love and labor together for a more just world, Freire sincerely believed that relationships of solidarity could be nurtured and political dreams of freedom regenerated. He asserted that the notion that we as human beings must unite ourselves with the world and others in the process of social and political co-creation, that this was necessary so that our collective participation in the labor of struggle could also impel us towards a deeper understanding of ourselves as historical beings. And this notion of historical beings and being subjects of our own history is absolutely essential. And one of the interesting things is that it is one of the pieces that is taken in a way often in hegemonic schooling, and I'll talk a little more about that. This is also then a force that moves us beyond this uh, spiritual transcendence or personal abnegation or political negation of the dialectic between consciousness and the material. Rather, Freire asserted a love that is born and emerges directly out of our social participation and unwavering political commitment to the transformation of the historical moments in which we exist as grounded subjects. So we're not, it's, it's not about how we change, you know, that that's happening out there. It's how do we change the conditions in which we are facing daily, the conditions that we see on the street, the conditions of the people that we come across every single day. Keeping all this in mind then, we can better appreciate Freire's concerns with the dehumanizing forces so prevalent in hegemonic schooling. He was adamant about the political necessity to unveil authoritarian pedagogies in the classroom, which obstruct the pleasure of life and the principle of love, generating alienation in both teachers and students and a deep sense of our estrangement from nature. This in turn arouses deep anxieties and insecurities that interfere with cultivating and nurturing the political imagination, the epistemological curiosity, and the joy of learning that is necessary to our practice. Freire wrote in Pedagogy of the Impress about this historical and systematic disregard for the respect and dignity of students. Um, that serve on one hand to breed helplessness and disempowerment, while on the other it spawns uncritical forms of resistance that can work against the interests of the oppressed. So Freire contended that oppression then is best served by keeping the oppressed confused and estranged from one another, steeped in the sentiments of fatalism and inferiority that blame students for their academic failure and blame workers for their material misfortunes. It's the same as you know, blaming those who are poor for being poor. In his conceptualization of love as a motivational force for struggle, Freire linked then the, his pedagogy of love to political values that nurture emancipatory relationships. This element of relationships is absolutely central to learning and to our teaching. Some of this, uh, these uh, include faith and dignity in our relationships with others, social responsibility for our world, participation in the co-creation of knowledge, and solidarity across our differences. Directly and indirectly then, Freire touched on the essence of love as inseparable to our labor as educators and democratic citizens of the world. Similar to Eric Fromm, um, Eric Fromm's vision that Freire embraced the idea that one loves that for when one, one labors, and one labors for that which one loves. So the, the sense, I mean, in, in, in the area of education, for example, one of the things that is so frustrating to me is that sometimes when I come across teachers or professors even in universities who hate their students, I mean, they, 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 who really don't like teaching. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, please leave. <laughs> you know, the students need more. They need love. They need to feel that you have a joy about teaching and a joy about what you're doing. And if you don't, then get out because you're doing a disservice to everybody, right? So anyway, this points then uh, undeniably to the extent to which Freire himself intimately and passionately loved the world, a significant feature of both his pedagogy and personal way of being, whether he was with children, with students, with colleagues, with family, friends, or simply the many people who crossed 
his path every day. I mean, he was the kind of person that if he went to a store, you know, he would look at the person in their eyes. He would actually engage the person who he was paying to, or, or the person who was taking his food order as a human being. And then he would, he would come to this, this, this sense of, com of, of kinship even with them. And I think that often we have lost that. We've lost that sense that we are, in fact, interdependent human beings that need one another. Although there are those who uh, often have dis dismissed uh, or critiqued Freire's ideas and language to diminish the power of his political influence, and we've seen this in terms of feminists who said, well, you know, he only used he in pedagogy in the press. Later on, he himself, um, work to change that language. So throughout his life, he resisted the tyranny of binaries and his own philosophies of ideas, political interpretations, pedagogical practices, grounded in an enormous sense of responsibility to use his privilege in the interests of the oppressed. Freire stressed the importance of practicing respect, patience, and faith if we are to dismantle the structures of domination that alienate and exploit those who exist overwhelmingly as the slaves of capital, no matter what our illusions are. Once again, Freire's own capacity for love was an exercise in precisely this humanizing relational dynamic, one that seeks to identify or empathize with the core of another person, simply uh, beyond simple superficial responses or stereotypical discourses. For example, often working class students or activists of color in the United States are perceived as being angry. But rather than to see them beyond preconceptions of anger or to acknowledge that all human beings who are anxious, worried, isolated, fearful, repressed, or suffering will exhibit symptoms of anger. In other words, that being angry to a certain extent is is communicating that something is, is not right, right? Most teachers often would stay um, somewhere, you know, on the superficial of that, devoid of insights that the oppressive conditions that many of the students uh, live in informs their anger or frustration. So in other words, the conditions in which we live in are real. They have an impact on our lives. And of course, if you live in, if you have everything done for you, if you have, if you're comfortable, your life is going to be different than in fact if you live in conditions that are very poor. It doesn't mean that you don't experience joy, you know, whether you're poor or rich. It means that you live under different conditions, different challenges, and different struggles, and that we must acknowledge those. Fendi, however, noted very much the sense that being angry just like the right to be loved, that we have the right to be angry because it serves as a legitimate motivational foundation for decolonizing struggles. For just anger reminds us that we're not meant to live as objects of persecution or domination. In the same light, Freire asserted, my right to be angry presupposes that the historical experience in which I participate tomorrow is not a given, but a challenge and a problem. Hence, our just anger is grounded in our indignation of inhumanity. Therefore, one of the most important tasks of a pedagogy of love, then, is to create the conditions for students to engage in the experience of assuming themselves as social, historical, thinking, communicating, transformative, creative persons, dreamers of, possible, of possibilities, of possible utopias, capable of being angry because of their capacity to be, to love. This is particularly so given that many educators are so disconnected from the conditions of, of their students or of the other, of whoever they see as being other, and frightened by the racialized or class misconceptions to allow themselves to genuinely know their students as vital human beings. Instead, students remain objects to be managed, to be manip manipulated and controlled in ways that may eventually draw out of them prescribed answers. And for Freire, that was part of the problem, that we, instead of looking for prescribed answers in our work with students, that we wanted to find organic knowledge, that that was, that that was how we truly created knowledge together. 
However, neither students nor communities are objects to be manipulated or tweaked here or there. Freire knew that learning, like loving, is an act that students must choose freely to practice through the exercise of their social agency and their personal empowerment. With this at the core of our pedagogical sensibilities, we can avert then fixed notions of prescriptions uh, of the other, for given the changing and evolving nature of our humanity, seldom can we know our students or even ourselves fully. And this was a really important piece because what my experience has been that when somebody thinks they know it all, I mean, do you know some of those people? <laughs> no, you don't know anybody, right? <laughs> You know, sometimes there's these folks who just act like there is nothing that you can possibly offer them. That they just, they just have it, you know, they, they've learned it all, right? And what's really sad about it is when we, when we behave that way, when I, you know, when we behave that way, what we're doing is we're shutting down our capacity to engage and to learn with others. Because the truth of the matter is all our knowledge is partial. All of us here is partial. And so the consequence of that is a good one in the sense that if knowledge is, if I only have a little piece of knowledge, right, I need you in order to understand the world better. Because you have pieces of knowledge that I have no idea about. And I think that that's the kind of humility that we have to come to this work with. Feliz pedagogy of love and sought to override preconditions or patterns of hegemonic schooling in how we name the world by providing a deep mythologizing context in which we as students and teachers can consider the political consequences of particular ways of thinking and its consequences in, in the process that we're asked to move away from fixed or prescribed notions of life and towards a relational and contextual understanding of knowledge, of history, and community. One of the interesting things of the, of the lecture that, that uh, Professor Campo gave us uh, at the museum was around this question of history, and that you could change one word you know, just change one word. It is, rather than saying Columbus discovered America, you say Columbus arrived. And just by that word, you change the very paradigm of how you think about that experience and what that experience means. This is also then re relevant to a critical literacy informed by Freire's understanding of literacy as a decolonizing practice, which is above all a social and political commitment in the process of reading the word and the world, uh, Freire also sought to explore the relationship between po uh, political purpose and pedagogy as vital to building consciousness, mobilization, and organization for the defense of rights and for the laying claim to justice. Hence, the capacity to read the word and the world is fundamentally linked to a larger political struggle against hegemony, against oppression, when uh, which entails a critical literacy that prepares students uh, toward a more just future. And this requires then opportunities for students to become critical and empowered cultural citizens, prepared to contend with the impact of material inequalities and social exclusions on, the lives, on, on their lives and their communities. This then implies that we enter into an evolutionary process of consciousness. Um, for Freire, this question of consciousness was so significant that part of the purpose of education was for us together to evolve in relationship to a humanizing consciousness by which individuals then become critically aware that their active involvement in the historical process is directly linked to their capacity to denounce injustice and announce a more just world. So resistance then is anchored to a dialectical process of consciousness from which students and communities then begin to name and to challenge and take action to counter the consequences of values, of policies, of practices that threaten their dignity and the right to be. In this sense then, resistance is understood as an important precursor to becoming critically conscious. So as a teacher, for example, often teachers, uh, when students start you know, pushing back, resisting something that you're teaching, right? Sometimes teachers get really upset by that, and their tendency is to want to shut them down, you know? 
Well, Fanny would say, oh, don't shut them down. That's, that's a good thing. The fact they're resisting is a good thing because they're, whether they're engaging, it's their way of engaging in the situation. And the fact that they're, they're resisting is meaningful in that we have a responsibility to engage them about why this resistance is going on. And that our willingness to enter into that place is part of having tremendous courage and faith in our students. Grounded then in this perspective, a pedagogy of love points to the importance of a classroom and community conditions that support teachers and students and communities to enter intentionally into a lived historical process as subjects of their own destinies. I'm gonna uh, skip down to uh, the next section, just to the ne next section of conscientization. Uh, for almost five decades, uh, Paulo Freire's work has invited educators to embrace the struggle for critical consciousness and social transformation as a road yet to be made, which because it is unknown, must be traced out step by step in our organic relationship with the world and in the process of our labor as educators, as community people, as cultural citizens, and as re revolutionary leaders. For Freire, conscientization does not take place in the abstract, um, in <laughs> place in, in it out there somewhere where you can't, you know, you can't touch it, abstract beings out in the air, but in real men and women in the social structures, it cannot remain at the level of the individual. So we can't, for example, if you believe that we, we need to, to struggle against poverty, there's no way that we can think that it's just about individuals or how individuals get along or don't get along, right? Because the issue of poverty is a larger systemic reality, a, a systemic problem. The process then signals the moment of consciousness um, when individuals in communities experience breakthroughs. And this is something that we want. I mean, we often think that people aren't thinking about their lives, but those breakthroughs that we, that we experience when we work together is a kind of awakening and an opening of our minds. And we decide then to take another path despite risks or uncertain futures. Freire considered this process then of conscientization as a central principle of his critical pedagogy in that it opens the epistemological field for the expression of curiosity and imagination. Consciousness then is one of the roads that we have to follow, we must follow, if we are to deepen our consciousness, our, our awareness of the conditions that defy and betray our revolutionary dreams. Similarly, Freire's knowledge of human consciousness is unfinished. And this is a central understanding, the sense of ourselves as human beings as unfinished. It's also linked to a critical evolutionary process whose openness enlivens our dialectical relationship with the world and beckons us towards a new humanizing paradigm with a connection between matter and consciousness is inextricably tied to our interdependent existence with all the world. And what I mean by that is that sometimes there's a tendency to think that the way that we think doesn't have an impact on the material conditions that we create through our thinking. And in fact, that is not true. Everything that exists here, all, all the concrete material conditions that we find in the world, in this building, these were created as a, con a consequence of somebody's consciousness, of a group of people you know, deciding to make decisions about where they put the windows and how, the, you know, what, where, how they organize this field. And they did it because they had some sense that maybe one day we would be in a room like this and there need to be plenty of room to put plenty of chairs. <laughs> but that comes from people thinking about the world. And so often that element is, is just kind of skipped or missed. So this evolution then of social consciousness is well echoed in Antonio Machado's words. Se hace, we'll go right on the slide, se hace el camino al andar, or we make the road by walking. So that, if you think of that philosophically as, as a philosophy, as an ethics of life, is that we make the world as we walk then suddenly we're not separated from the world. We're not separated from the, the, the lived 
uh, experiences that we are involved in, we are not separated from our lived history. And this is essential in relationship to this work. Also, um, part of what we're looking at here is rather than adhere to prescribed roles and structures that repress our humanity, Freire urges uh, for the development of, of this emancipatory consciousness through a critical praxis where we bring theory and practice together. Uh, and it's a critical praxis of love that requires our ongoing participation and co-creation as cultural citizens who know that we are in the world to change the world. That is just part of what human beings are in the world to, to, to change and, and to transform our world. In this way, then, knowledge and breakthroughs of consciousness reflect the evolving social experience of people involved in collective struggle and so break breakthroughs of the emancipatory awareness are, are not the privilege of one person. Not, you know, sometimes we think that only people that are formally educated can be creative. We, say, you know, we start learning that. But the truth of the matter is there is knowledge that happens through the formal education context, and there's tremendous knowledge that happens in the informal education context. So we're always learning. We don't learn just in the classroom. Often some of the most powerful learning experiences we have are the experiences that happen outside of the classroom. So one of the, the pieces for Freddy in all of this is how do we bring the experiences that students have uh, in their lives, how do we bring them into the classroom itself? Um, Freddy argued that social consciousness does not occur then automatically. It doesn't just, I mean, we, we have to, we work to become conscious. We work to learn. Nor could it be understood as some kind of linear phenomenon. Instead, emancipatory consciousness arises through an organic process of human engagement which requires critical pedagogical interaction that nurtures the dialectical relationship between human beings and the world. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I have a whole lot more that I can say. Thank you, Kevin, for being. But I'm, what I'm thinking is that I want to. I, I know that we only have a, we have about a half hour, and I'm thinking that maybe what would be good now. I've I've, I've shared with you a whole bunch of ideas, and I uh, and I'd be happy. By the way, if you if you email me, I'll send you the complete talk. I'm, I'm happy to do that. But I would like us to have some time to interact. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. All right. So, so thank you. <laughs>